Okay, we are going to start with our keynote session. My name is Dacia Tienza. I'm from the Natural Science Museum in Barcelona. Please give a big applause to Rob. He's going to join us on the screen. Hello, everybody. How lovely to see you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Rob. I'm sorry not to be with you in person. I'm, a, a, as a climate activist, I took a pledge about 12 years ago not to fly, and I haven't flown since then. And it's a very long train journey, and I was going to do it, but I didn't. In the end, I just couldn't make, quite make the time. But it's lovely to be here, and I hope that this, this format will work for you. And uh, so I want to just start by talking about where we are. I know you've talked about climate change already. I won't talk about it much, but I think it's really important to recognize that we have everything that we associate with human culture, human civilization, human civilization from the beginning of agriculture, the great pyramids through to the beginning of the industrial revolution all happened in this incredibly stable Band where CO2 concentrations never went above 280 parts per million and the climate was pretty uh, stable during that time. And we have now burst out of that uh, and into completely uncharted territory. We are, we are in a new world, literally, and we are on a trajectory which is absolutely terrifying. I, I often say to people, if you are not regularly terrified about the climate and ecological emergency, you're not paying attention. And it's something that, that, that is existential and underpins absolutely everything that we do. I feel like what's most important really at this moment is the stories that we tell about where we go from here. And this is an image created by David Holmgren, who's the co-originator of permaculture, who says there are four main stories we like to tell each other. One is this idea of a techno explosion. The human beings are so incredible that we can just, in the kind of Elon Musk, maybe we'll just go and live on Mars kind of fantasy nonsense. I've never seen the appeal myself of a planet with no trees. But this idea that technology is just incredible and that there are no limits is really a dangerous fantasy, I think. Techno stability is the idea that we can just keep running uh, a consumer based growth based industrial society. We'll just switch all the cars for electric ones and we'll run everything on solar and it'll be fine, which, again, is a really dangerous myth because it requires us not fundamentally changing anything about who we are and how we relate to the world. And it doesn't recognize any resource constraints, again, that we really need to. The third is collapse, which is a narrative that I hear increasingly from many people in the environmental movement who now say collapse is now completely inevitable. I don't subscribe to that, but I think that the longer we leave it without doing anything, the, the more likely that becomes. What's always underpinned my work is the fourth one, the light blue one here called energy descent, which is the idea that we need to move away from using as much energy as we use today to a world where we use much less energy but to do so in such a way that where we get to at the end is much, much better than where we started from. And that means we have to rethink how we, how we, where our food comes from, how our energy works, but also how our education system works, how our whole economy uh, works. It's more of a, a degrowth kind of a model, but that's what really fits in with the demands that, that, that the climate scientists are giving us. And um, <clears throat> I love this statement, which, which was mentioned there at the beginning from the Institute for the Future in America. They say any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. So I'm here, my friends, today to say, please, in the work that you do, be more ridiculous. You know, we have moved the climate emergency, we have left it so long that the idea that we're going to tackle it by moving in little incremental steps is really about 30 years behind us. What we need now is big, bold, ambitious things which actually fit with the urgency that the climate scientists are not just asking, are demanding of us, pleading of us. I recently spoke at a conference in Switzerland where the person who spoke, before, which was with 400 young people who work in the organic food sector, really enthusiastic young people, love organic food and all of this. And the man who spoke before me was from a, a, the biggest supermarket chain in Switzerland. And five times in his talk, he said, and I urge you to be pragmatic. 
And I said, when I got to speak, I said, please don't be pragmatic. The last thing the world needs is to you to be pragmatic. We need you to be ridiculous and bold and, and audacious. Uh, and, and I would make the same plea to you as well. This is <coughs> a picture which I love from the late 1960s in the United States. The first thing I always think is how slim everybody is, is really quite extraordinary. But, but also this was at a time when if you went to the beach, people just parked their car on the beach. So this was what it looked like when you went to the beach. Shortly after this picture was taken, that changed. And I think we can all agree it's much nicer now to go to the beach and it not be covered in cars. But you can guarantee there were people who said, but, but I can't imagine going to the beach and not parking my car on the beach. The fact that some people can't imagine something is no reason why we shouldn't do it. Um, recently, the United Nations wrote a report where they concluded that any chance of staying below one and a half degrees is now over unless we see what they called a rapid transformation of society. So every newspaper, every article I read, every magazine cover like this had headlines like this, say goodbye to 1.5. I didn't see a single one that said, why don't we have a rapid transformation of society? Let's do that rapid transformation of society thing. Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be a, a we, we could, we could. It's not like it's working amazingly well as it is at the moment. Why don't we do that rapid transformation of society thing? And it troubles me greatly how quickly we have moved from saying it's not really a problem to saying, oh, well, it's too late now. It's like if you woke up in the night at home and you smelt smoke and you just rang your insurance company. There's a bit in the middle where you do something about it. And I worry that there was a survey I saw recently in the US that said 70% of people agree that climate change is urgent and only 15% of people think we can actually do something about it. So we have an imagination gap. We have a, we have a space where, where, where our thinking, our ability to dream, to look forward is really, really failing us. I recently saw uh, a woman at the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington wearing a t-shirt which has inspired my work ever since. It said, I've been to the future, we won. It gave me goosebumps. When, when I first saw that, it gave me goosebumps. And as I said, this now really underpins the work that I do as a climate activist going forward. And I hope that by the end of this session, you might feel similarly in, inspired to think in the same way. And I want to just introduce uh, one, of my, one of my heroes, a woman called Rashida Phillips who works in North Pittsburgh uh, in, 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 in a, an area, in, in a neighborhood which is being cleansed by gentrification of people of color. And in the daytime, she's a housing lawyer. And in the rest of her time, she runs this amazing project called Black Quantum Futurism, where she talks about time travel as a kind of a radical tool. She does big community events, not where they gather people's oral histories, but where they gather people's oral futures and she talks about time in a really interesting way and I apologize for the quality of this image it was scanned out of a very very small book but I think you can get the idea she says in in the west we talk about time as a line it's a linear process we go past present future and we're heading towards the future as a kind of a thing that we kind of know what parts of it are going to be like she says in more African understandings of time or in Afrofuturism, they talk about it more as being like a wheel and we're in the middle. And there are many, many different futures that are radiated out from that. Uh, and that we need to get much better at being able to explore those rather than just imagining that there is one future. So as was said at the beginning, I live in a small town in the southwest of England called Totnes. And if you have heard of it, there may be some things you know about it. But what you probably don't know about it is that we are home to, um, to the world's first successful time travel program. And we have successfully constructed a time machine. And this is a picture of myself and my colleague, uh, Mr. Kit, uh, uh, ready to embark on one of our adventures to 2030. It's something that, that we do very regularly. And uh, we were inspired by Bell Hooks, who said, what we cannot imagine cannot come into being. And uh, this is another picture of us as well, getting ready to set off uh, on one of our journeys. And what we do, and we travel there to make sound recordings. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So what I want to do in this presentation, as was kind of insinuated at the beginning, is I want to take you, I want to tell you about a recent adventure that we had 
to 2030. So you might like to think of me as being the kind of Marco Polo of the climate movement, having just come back on an adventure to 2030. And it's important to say, this is a 2030, it's not a utopia, it's also not a dystopia, but what I want to take you to is the 2030 that resulted from us doing absolutely everything we could possibly have done between now and then. So it felt like we lived through a kind of a revolution of the imagination. Those were the most exhilarating seven years anybody ever lived through where we really did extraordinary things. So our trip started in this street with our time machine and uh, not very remarkable place. And we set the, uh, we, we disabled the, uh, uh, the, the disbelief suspenders and we fired up the machine and set it for 2030. And when we stepped out into 2030, that same street looked like this. That shift had happened within this very short period of time. And the first impression on arriving there was firstly, how delicious the air smelled. It smelled like spring in the Alps or something and how much louder the bird song was. But it was also really visible in people that there was a, a new sort of sense of possibility. When we, the 2023 that we left behind, so many people felt despair and there was very little hope and people didn't believe we could do it. In that 2030, there was a fragile but very real sense of, do you know what? I think we might just do this. I think we might just do this. And people could see the world changing around them, which gave them belief. And that belief uh, was really growing. And my friends, the first thing I have to really tell you about that we saw there was the bicycle rush hours. The bicycle rush hours of 2030 really blew my mind. I'd never seen so many bicycles in the morning, in the evening, like a river of bicycles because we had built the infrastructure. Around 2024, it was really recognized by governments all over the world that for every million euros you spend on building cycling infrastructure, you save 38 million euros off your national health bill. This is investment in the future of the country. And our economic model began to move like that. We recognized around 2024 that it cost 11,000 pounds to house somebody who's homeless and 90,000 pounds if that person is homeless in terms of mental health support and all the other things that we need to give people. So we started to think very differently. I loved noticing that in many places they had a sign like this. And I remember back in 2023, if you drove into a city, you would often see a sign like this for cars, telling you about the car parking spaces. By 2030, the signs are like this for bicycles. And they take you to these incredible underground spaces where those bicycles are now stored. Clean, safe, beautiful places where you just leave your bicycles in there hundreds of thousands. And because cycling has now become completely normal and completely commonplace and just what we do because we built the infrastructure for it. And, and, it, and it was a, a glorious, a glorious thing to see. The next thing that I wanted to tell you about that we saw was everybody told us about how in 2024 there was a collapse again of, of, of the worst gambling speculative banks. And this time, unlike 2008, where we bailed them out and we, and we gave them money to continue, this time we bought them international public ownership to use their resources to fund and drive the Green New Deal, the kind of Marshall Plan about climate change that was triggered by those incredibly hot summers of 2022 and 2023. And we realized we needed to really increase our ambition on this. It meant that many buildings that used to be occupied by banks were now occupied by very different kinds of organizations. It was one of the big changes we saw as we went around was ownership. So many more buildings and businesses and infrastructure are in community ownership and collective ownership rather than now, rather than in private ownership. And this place that we went to was now, as I say, home to many different enterprises, but upstairs in that building, uh, that there was was a co-housing project 300 people living there they grow food on the roof they have their own small forest uh on their terrace uh you know th this this shift in ownership actually uh brought about much more equality much more democracy much more involvement uh in people's lives we and uh, it was interesting to see the number of things that weren't around anymore shell 
BP Total went out of business around 2027, 2026, uh, and some supermarkets did as well. We visited this place that we've in 2023 was a supermarket, home to one big business, is now home to about 40 different small businesses. So the economy has started to break into smaller pieces, uh, which people have much more ownership over. And I love to see how many new buildings were being built using materials from the region where that building was being built. Because we recognized in 2023 that 9% uh, of all carbon emissions globally came from the production of concrete and cement. And so we moved away from that very quickly. And to see this building here, <clears throat> which was built a nine story apartment block, they're now building. Uh, we also visited 11, 12 story apartments built using timber in a structural way, in new ways, using straw bales for the insulation, using clay plasters on the walls. So we're building buildings which are incredibly energy efficient, incredibly healthy to live in, but which have also created a whole new local economy keeping money locally, creating new opportunities for people and involving many more people in the workforce who previously didn't really work in construction. And another thing that I have to tell you about as someone who has just come back from 2030 was how beautiful it was to see how many streets had been closed. The people on the streets had mobilized to get their streets closed to cars. The people on this street were very happy to show us this picture of what this street had looked like back in 2023 before they mobilized and got that changed. And one of the things that, well, that I loved seeing was the amount of this concrete and tarmac broken up because now in our cities, one of the biggest new businesses and sources of employment is the removal of hard surfaces because we realized in those hot summers of 2022, 2023, that in a city when you get above about 35, 36 degrees, concrete and tarmac kill people because they stop that city from being able to cool. So now we're taking away more of that, more and more of that concrete and tarmac, replacing it with things that allow, allow water to be absorbed, uh, to allow much more biodiversity to appear in our cities. So there are many, many opportunities that have been created by this shift as well. So. In 2030, as we are, looking back to 2023, what could we see happening in 2023 that started this happening? I think one of the key things was that we got much, much better. And as well as scientists, I think we got much, much better at talking about longing, about working with longing. And Don DeLillo, the novelist, once said, longing on a large scale is what makes history. You do not generate longing just by talking about extinction and collapse. And so we saw artists like this, a man called James Mackay at the University of Leeds, who drew the future, drew these pictures of the future that created such longing in people that they wanted to live to see that world, a city with most with biodiversity back, a city where we're using that space that we've taken away from cars in very different and creative ways. Images like this were hugely impactful. This was a picture created by the municipality in Barcelona in 2021, where they announced they were gonna close 30% of the streets in the center of the city and turn them into forests because every one of those trees makes the space underneath it eight degrees cooler than if that tree wasn't there. And But they used images like this to sort of inspire people that this was the change that needed to happen. And I want to just tell you a little story, which is a story that I love, uh, which comes from 1964 in Zambia. And I'll, I'll explain why this story matters to me. But in 1964, America and Russia were competing to put the first man, had to be a man, of course, on the moon. And, uh, and in Zambia, which had just become independent from decades of British colonial rule, a man called Edward Makuka Unkoloso, who had been a freedom fighter in the Zambian Liberation Army, announced the Zambian space program. He said the first person on the moon is going to be a young woman from Zambia. And uh, he wrote letters to governments all around the world asking them to send him millions of dollars for his space research program. Nobody sent him anything. And this was how he trained his team of astronauts for weightlessness in space. He would roll them down a hill uh, in an empty oil drum. Sometimes he would swing them on the rope and then when they were at the top, he would cut the rope uh, so that they would experience uh, a, a very short period of weightlessness 
uh, presumably before they fell to the ground and hurt themselves really quite badly. But um, he was he was very convinced that this was going to happen, and he was very ambitious. He also planned a mission to Mars, and this newspaper cutting says uh, that he, they were going to take a, the, the young female astronaut, two cats. I'm not sure he had calculated the weight of enough cat food uh, to get you all the way to Mars, and a missionary, because as he said, I have warned the missionary, he must not force Christianity on the people of Mars if they do not want it, which was very good of him, I think. So, so as you may have noticed, the first person on the moon wasn't from Zambia. And many people just thought Edward Makuka and Coloso was completely insane and, and kind of forgot about his story. When he died in 1989, the Zambian government buried him with the, with the highest honours they could give to their citizens. Because what he did in that newly independent nation was to open up a story, was to open up that belief to say, well, why shouldn't the first person on the moon be from Zambia? We can do anything. We are a newly independent nation. We can do absolutely anything. And I, when I talked about being ridiculous at the beginning, he wasn't afraid for people to say that he was ridiculous because he had a story that people really needed to hear that opened and expanded people's sense of who they were. And I feel like we need to all be a bit more like Edward Makuka and Coloso in the work that we do. And that was the shift that happened in 2023 that was one of the key things that unlocked this future that I'm describing to you. Another thing that happened around 2023 was that activism became much, much better at talking about a different kind of a future, rather than just saying what it was against, rather than just uh, railing against what it didn't like, it became much better at creating what I call pop-up tomorrows. It took its vision of how, it, of, of how we want the world to be and made it real. This was uh, uh, Waterloo Bridge in London in April 2019, going back a little bit further to 2019, when Extinction Rebellion closed that bridge for two weeks and they turned it into a forest. They put trees all down the middle of that bridge. And I know a lot about it because my wife was there for the whole two weeks. She's very, very involved with Extinction Rebellion. She's been arrested seven times uh, already. I'm very, very proud of her. And, uh, and, and I think that I've spoken to many people who, wor who worked near there and who would stop on that bridge every day and would walk across that bridge every day full of traffic, who stopped on that bridge and said, oh, why can't it always be like this? It gave people a taste of a different future. Rilke, the poet, once said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And I think we forget that as activists and as scientists. We need to bring alive in people's dreams, in their yearning, in their longing, the kind of future that we could still create. And uh, that happened recently, uh, last year, in Trafalgar Square, a group of rewilding activists rewilded Trafalgar Square just for one day. Pop up tomorrow, it came, it went again. Where would you create a pop up tomorrow to give people a taste, an immersive taste of how very different the future could be. So meanwhile, back in 2030, we went to visit this extraordinary place, which is now the model around the world. This is by 2030, this is not exceptional at all. But for me, this is the first time I'd seen a place like this, a whole neighborhood designed with no space for cars, <clears throat> a whole way of living with no cars and uh, incredible big trees, very energy efficient buildings, very e e effective renewable energy grids, bicycles everywhere, three, three year old children riding bicycles. I never saw that back uh, in 2023. And uh, um, this, uh, this picture here is uh, a street, I, 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 you might notice there is actually a car in this picture, <clears throat> but actually what they, they assured me that actually they just keep this particular car for growing courgettes in. It's quite an effective little kind of mobile greenhouse, I think. But I mentioned that when we go to 2030, we do it because we want to make recordings of what it sounds like. Imagine if you could travel to 2030 and you could record what it sounds like and you could bring those recordings back to play to people in 2023, how that would impact our sense of what's possible, our sense of belief, 
our sense of how that future could be? What would it do to our longing to be able to hear that 2030? So my friends, to, now I'm gonna share with you something extraordinary, which is an actual recording from those streets in 2030. Ooh. Uh, so uh, you might like to close your eyes and you might like to imagine that you are in whichever city it is uh, that, that, you, that, that, that you live near or that you live in and to imagine it lasts about a minute and you'll hear bicycles and trams and children playing in the street and close your eyes and just allow yourself to really immerse yourself in that street of 2030. I think it finished. I can't quite hear the end. Um, did it finish? I think it finished. So we have many recordings like that that we made in different places uh, on our travels through 2030. Another thing that we saw in many places was that many underground spaces, as I mentioned, we don't need underground car parks anymore because the amount of cars is so much less. So we see many places where those underground places are being used now to grow mushrooms for food, for medicine, for construction materials, for leather substitutes. Uh, it's created many, many jobs, many, many jobs in those former underground car parks. And a big shift that happened, obviously, there was a massive transformation in our education system that enabled that. We moved from just uh, uh, thinking, seeing children as vessels that we needed to pour knowledge into, and we saw them as being uh, that we needed to, 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 to nurture them as empowered, practical, uh, compassionate, empathic, informed, critically thinking uh, young people who were able to roll their sleeves up and play a ch their, their part in the challenges that the world faced. And part of that was that we, we, we allowed and worked with children to design their own schools. So this was a school that we visited that had been designed by the kids who had worked with an architect for a year to design the school that they wanted. And what they had created was just uh, completely extraordinary. And, uh, and actually, it turns out that when you ask children what they would like their school to be like, they'll tell you, we wanted to have a rainforest in the middle. And so this school has a rainforest in the middle. And the, the, the transformation in our education system and the sense of confidence and possibility in young people was, was really moved me very, very deeply uh, to see that. And um, <clears throat> another big, big transformation was around 2023, it became very, very clear in that summer of 2023 and the, and the water shortages that, that happened across uh, Europe, in France, many regions of France uh, were running out of water, Spain and so on. It, it was, became clear we could not just continue with our same agricultural model and assuming that we would always have access to water, we had to fundamentally transform what agriculture was and, what, and how we did it. So this is a farm that we visited now where trees are much more integrated into our landscape. Landscapes are much more diverse. The ground is kept covered with plants all the time. The biodiversity has now bounced back into our agricultural systems. We eat a diet, a, a different diet. We eat much more mushrooms and seaweed and, uh, and, and locally produced food. Uh, it, and it means that our landscapes are so much more interesting than they were before. And one of the things that I loved and I'm so in love with this, is that we had developed the humility to recognize that beavers 
are much better hydrological engineers than human beings could ever be. And so all the all the higher ground we 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 gave to the beavers because the beavers are so brilliant at engineering those landscapes to hold water that otherwise just ran through those landscapes. As a result, we don't see flooding anymore because the beavers have created these extraordinary landscapes in which the biodiversity has exploded, in which that water is now held. We don't see silt running away from landscapes. Uh, it's been transformative because we developed that humility to do that. I am so in love with beavers uh, now, I, having visited 2030, that it's almost impossible to describe. There was a huge shift in democracy. Now big decisions around at the national scale, the regional scale and the local scale are made using citizens assemblies where people deliberate on behalf of their fellow citizens. It's much more mature. It's much more deliberative. It's beautiful. And the, the decisions made are much wiser as a result. And now every city, every town has what's called a civic imagination office, which started the first one was in Bologna in Italy in 2012. Everywhere has one now. Skillfully facilitated spaces that invite people to be really imaginative, but then meet them in the middle and say, OK, that's a great idea. Let's make that happen. We, as the municipality, can offer this and this and this. You can offer that. Let's make a pack. So we see much more of this kind of municipalities working together with communities, working to facilitate their imagination. In London in 2023, there was something, uh, a, the, a local council there who started something called civic uh, imagination activist training imagination activist training for all of their staff and that model has now spread through local authorities everywhere so we have local authorities who are really happy to be ridiculous uh, in what they're doing because they recognize that was what was needed the university system has really changed now every course in the universities is taught through the lens of the climate and ecological emergency and it's really changed what they teach how they teach it and how hands-on and applied that is this is a university that we went to visit where there is no lawn left around that university anymore they grow so much food the students learn the skills to grow the food and also every time the university needs new buildings the students build those buildings whatever their course is they have a role to play in that construction whether it's in monitoring evaluation whatever it is energy modeling or just getting in there and actually building stuff and this this building here <clears throat> was built using local timber, local hemp, lime. It used one and a half thousand old tires that would otherwise have been thrown away. So universities are now kind of living, breathing uh, models of the transition that we so desperately needed to see. And, uh, and everybody feels so excited and exhilarated at being part uh, of the shift that we're seeing. This is a place that we went to that really moved me very, very deeply. This was a town where way back in early 2020, if any of you can remember but back that far, uh, the local council there bought this piece of land that was going to be developed for uh, executive housing. And they created a food garden there, which now supplies 80% of all the food for all the local schools. And it led to a, a change in how food was produced was produced the children would come out and see where their food was coming from be involved in that they could identify all the plants it led to a big shift then in terms of how the food was cooked in the school fresh food cooked by the way sodexo that company who across europe had had school dinner contracts uh, for decades went out of business in 2027 because nobody needed them anymore because we had built something so much better that met our needs so much better we saw a really unexpected culture shift that accompanied this, where 60, 70 percent of families who had kids in those schools began to change their shopping habits because the culture changed in the school. So we started to recognize that when you take bold, ambitious steps like this, you have no idea where they're going to go and what they're going to lead to. So this is now the new normal across Europe. Why would you feed your schools in any other way than this? And there was a model that started in Belgium in 2014 in the city of Liège, called, which was called the Liège Food Belt. 
And it started with a local transition group, community organization, who came up with a what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? And they planned a Liège food belt. I went back in 2018. By that time, they had already raised 5 million euros of investment from the people of Liège, not from the bank, not from the municipality, from the citizens. They had started 27 new cooperatives, four shops in the city centre, a farm, two vineyards, a brewery. I had to go and you know visit the brewery. We all, we all have to do our bit for the revolution. And um, they, uh, by, and by 2023 already, this was the model the municipality was using for how it was changing how its schools, universities, hospitals procure uh, their food. And already by 2023, this model had spread to six other cities in Belgium and into France too. By 2030, this is the new normal. Every city is building a food belt, reconnecting the city to the land around it. The economy is changing. There is a great reskilling underway of people creating businesses to make that happen. It was a beautiful, uh, very moving thing uh, to see. And the last big shift that I want to tell you about that, that we saw that was so delightful was around energy. So Europe now, we, we use much less energy than we used back in 2023, a big decline, like I showed you at the beginning. But our quality of life has increased hugely. Our sense of social connection has increased hugely. And more than half of that renewable energy is in community ownership. So as communities, rather than putting our money into the banks, we, we, we invest our money into, into energy that we own. So energy democracy has become a very real thing. Energy has become something that we own and we benefit from rather than something done to us by, by, by companies elsewhere, which has led to a big, uh, a big economic shift. And so you see renewable energy generation around you on a daily basis. It's not something that happens in some kind of uh, distant power station somewhere. So, for a moment, I'm just I'm going to bring us back from 2030, back to 2023. Sorry, <laughs> but I, the point I want to make is that all of those stories that I've told you already exist. As William Gibson, the science fiction writer, said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So we started our journey in a street. That street is in Amsterdam. You can visit that street. The, the, the city with the bicycle rush hour, that's Utrecht in Holland. If you ever feel any despair about the future, go and sit by the train station in Utrecht at eight o'clock in the morning and the bicycle rush hour is extraordinary. The, the repurposed bank was is in um, uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. The supermarket that's been repurposed is in Rotterdam. The building built from local timber is in Grenoble in France. The uh, building, the school built by the kid, designed by the kids is in Madrid. The street closed to traffic is in Lausanne in Switzerland. The place I played you the recording from, the car-free neighborhood, is in uh, the Vauban in Freiburg in Germany. Incredible place. The mushrooms being grown underground is in Paris because a few years ago, the mayor of Paris ran a competition for alternative uses for underground car parks because there were so few people using those spaces. And there's lots of things happening there now. That landscape, the farm is a permaculture project I visited in the south of France. Incredible. The, 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 the civic imagination office is in Bologna, as I mentioned. That university where they're growing food is in Liège. The place where they're, the university where they're building the new building, that's in Luxembourg. The school uh, food place, that's in a town in France called Montsartou, and, uh, and then Liège, uh, as I mentioned. So all of those things already exist. We're not waiting for someone to invent some magic app or some secret amazing piece of technology that will allow us to solve everything. Everything we need to know is already here. Peter Kalmus, an incredible scientific, uh, uh, climate scientist, and an activist who cares so passionately and is so terrified about the science that he is producing that he super glued himself to the front of the Chase Bank, who still fund fossil fuels to a huge amount. He said, what, when asked what gives him hope, he said, the fact that we have barely tried yet. The fact that we've barely tried yet. So what do I do with all of this idea of I've been to the future, we won? So this is one project I'm doing 
where uh, I'm working with an amazing Belgian cartoonist to tell the story of how me and Mr. Kit uh, traveled to 2030 to gather these recordings. What did we see? What was it like? How was it? And then also, uh, so Kit is the most amazing producer of ambient, electronic, beautiful music. And we're doing this project called Field Recordings from the Future, where I go to these places that already sound like the future needs to sound like. And then he turns them into beautiful pieces of music. And that will hopefully be, be coming out next year sometime. And again, it's about that work around longing. We have to trigger and work with and nurture people's longing. And for, in order to do that, we need musicians, artists, street artists, script writers, actors, poets. It's not just something that we can do on our own as activists and as scientists. So I'm nearly at time. I want to just tell you one very short story to finish off, and then I think we have a little time for questions. So I recently did this research that was in the book From What Is to What If about what is the state of health of our collective imagination in 2023? And my conclusion was that at a time when we need to fundamentally reimagine everything, our collective imagination muscle, which should be a muscle like this, has become a muscle like this. We live in a time with a, a perfect storm of factors to, that are undermining our imagination. I don't have time to go through them now, but you'll find them in the book. And there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is where your memory and your imagination both fire from. And it's also the part of your brain that is particularly vulnerable to cortisol. So when we are anxious or stressed or in trauma or anxiety, it can shrink by up to 20%. And when that happens, we lose the ability to see the future in hopeful and positive ways. It feels to me like collect our collective hippocampus is shrinking and we need to figure out how to make it grow again. And how, what would that feel like? If we could do that, if for people to go through that experience of regrowing their hippocampus, literally or, or metaphorically. So I went to Dundee in Scotland to visit an incredible project called Art Angel, run by this fabulous woman called uh, Rosalie Summerton. They're on the first floor of an office block in the middle of Dundee, the city in Scotland with the highest levels of poverty and drug addiction. Tough place. And they say, when you come here, you're not a, you're not a client. You're not a patient. You're an artist and you're preparing work for an exhibition. And I met many people who are really happy to tell me their stories uh, of how of, of, uh, one woman said, I have two small children, a partner who are taking my own life. And now I can see the future again. Now that I've been coming here, it was very powerful to see the work they were doing every year in order to evaluate how well they're doing. They give their artists a piece of paper with two outlines of a human body. They say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here. The second to show how you feel since you've been coming to Art Angel. And I looked through a big pile of these and it was very moving. I just want to share one with you that really, really touched me. I feel when I look at that picture, that that's what, firstly, that's what it feels like to reconnect with that imaginative part of ourselves. And if there are any of you thinking, but I'm a scientist, I don't do imagination. Actually, most of the greatest scientists in history were also the most imaginative people. Albert Einstein always talked about how he would imagine himself as a proton flying through space. This was, um, uh, and but then the other thing about this picture is if we are to do what the climate scientists tell us we absolutely need to do, which is way more ambitious than net zero by 2050, which our governments love, which is a political target, not a scientific target. If we were to do what needs to be done, the imagination loves limits. The imagine when, when we put limits, we're so much more creative. If the next seven years were to be the period of time, that revolution of the imagination that took, that would create that 2030 I've just taken you to. What would it feel like to live through a revolution of the imagination? I have no idea. There's never been one in my lifetime. But for me, that's what this picture uh, communicates. And this picture is what gets me out of bed every morning to do the work that I do. So um, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. I hope this has worked and you've managed to stay awake during a, 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 a 40 minute virtual presentation. I look forward to your questions and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to join.
Thank you, Rob. I, I'm not sure if you hear, but it was a very big, big applause from, from the audience. I'm not sure he, will, he, he could hear you. Uh, I have to say thank you very much, Rob, for this enlightening, inspiring, touching, and motivating talk. I think without any doubt, uh, you appeal directly to our field, to our community, and I think we all want to be on that 2030 future, right? <laughs> okay, we are, uh, we will have a little bit time for, for questions, okay? <laughs> okay, it will be at 2030. If, please raise your hand, I will try to see you from here. And we have several microphones along the room. Nobody wants I, to I ask. have a question. OK. <laughs> uh, I'm Raquel at Excite. I was wondering, when you traveled to 2030, have you visited a science museum or science center? <laughs> You know, well, the, the first thing is I love, I love how your question starts with such a beautiful suspension of disbelief. It's like, I had this little talk recently, somebody said, so Rob, Rob, when you were in 2030, were there repair cafes everywhere? I, I said, <laughs> I, said I, I love that it's like you're saying, ah, Rob, I, I heard you went to Paris last week. Can you recommend a good cafe? Um, yeah, I think I, I, we did, actually, actually. And... Uh, <laughs> What was, what was really beautiful to see was the, that there had been a process in, 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 in those organizations and in many others around 2023, 2024, of, of recognizing that imagination space, that all organizations, whether we're universities or businesses or, or science museums, unless we actively create the space well-facilitated space to really boldly reimagine stuff. It's what I, a lot of the work I do now is going into organizations and helping them to kind of uh, exercise and stretch that imagination muscle and to be a bit ridiculous and to think. Because if we don't make that space, organizations just continue doing what they've always done. And so you have to, you have to stop and, and, and reevaluate. And in order to do that, you have to you have to, as an organization, say this work is of value and this work needs us to create space as an organization to really do that. So that had happened. And yeah, there were science museums that, that we went to that actually had changed the goal of what they were about to being about maximizing the well-being and the happiness of, of people around them. There was a whole movement that was called the Happy Museums movement that had really uh, 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 transformed things. And it, and it was much more... It was that, that science was much more kind of immersive. It was like experienced. It was something, uh, and and it and it people left filled with solutions and ideas because they could see all of those solutions uh, in practice. And also, one of the big changes that we had seen, I think, over that time was I mentioned it before was that critical thinking has now become a, a a key part of our education system. You know, we saw that rise, that very frightening rise in the early 2020s of kind of conspiracy theories and people who believed the earth was flat and that people that believed that climate change was a, was a hoax and who believed that Donald Trump was God or whatever it was. You know, we saw actually that, that, that there was a, an urgent need to bring critical thinking back into our education system and that that was something that was reflected in science museums as well. Thank you. Your, your talk was very inspiring. Thank you. Another hand from the audience. I'm pretty sure that you are curious about another things, right? Okay. I I will just. Uh, I think it was very uh, fantastic the the way that you just changed the way that we can just imagine this future. Um, I, I have a lot of notes about your, <laughs> about your, oh, there's a question. Okay, <laughs> I cannot see from here. Okay, um, okay. I'm Anke Schwarzwälder. Um, my question to you, Rob, where was, um, would you have any 
any idea, any fantasy on what a super luxurious lifestyle in the future could be? Because I would think that many people would like to follow those type of people that are on the private jets and super yachts, which we see in the harbor here. So what, what do you have any vision for that s small segment that has such a large influence on a large part of the population? Yeah, that's such an important question because, uh, you know, as I, I spend a lot of my time visiting transition groups uh, and community groups across Europe, I don't fly, so I don't go any further than, than that. But um, so the question I get asked a lot is, so what does the transition movement do to work with, with low income uh, and kind of disadvantaged communities, which is a really important question. No one ever asks me though, what are you doing to work with the, with the super rich? And I feel like that that's such an important area of work because um, the poorer communities are not the ones who are responsible for the climate and ecological emergency. And uh, so I think that one of the things that, that, that shifted between 2023 and 2030 was that that kind of ostentatious level of wealth just became socially appalling like it became socially unacceptable you know here in the uk now we have one in four young one in four single mothers goes hungry because they can't afford to feed their children 25 percent of families last winter couldn't turn their heating on all winter because it was too expensive you know that that as as a society has become more and more unequal and that, ex, that ex, those extremes of wealth happen i think we we will be we, we will be in a place where that kind of just uh, that kind of wealth is just is just not acceptable anymore. And because we recognise that, in order to fund the changes that we have to make, those changes that actually are the only way humanity is going to save itself, having a lot of money does not insulate you from climate change. It might make you feel like you're insulated from it for a few years, but what I think what happened in the in the mid 2020s was that there were a lot of people. And we already see it in 2023, people of, of, of wealth and who, a younger generation of people who, who inherited large, large amounts of land, large inheritances from their parents, who just thought we need, to, we need to rethink what this means and who put the land into community ownership, who, who, gave, who recognized that part of the money they had inherited came from colonization and slavery and who made reparations themselves. Uh, and who decided to use that land in a very different way. And I think that became the kind of new normal. That became what was cool. Actually having a private jet and flying to New York to buy a handbag just became considered completely insane. Why would, why would anybody do that? It became socially unacceptable and kind of revolting, a bit like smoking in hospital wards was uh, 50, 20 years before. So that was, that was the, the, the shift that happened. I think. And you had people actually like Leonardo DiCaprio, who, who back in 2020 made a film about climate change, where he managed to make a whole film about climate change and what needed to happen without at any point renegotiating what it meant to be a billionaire in the United States, what it meant to be a man with the 11th biggest super yacht in the world. That was never mentioned. It was all about what everyone else was going to do. His next film was all about what it looks like as a billionaire, to, as part of the 0.1%, to fundamentally change your expectations of what you think that's going to be, to fundamentally change your expectations of what you're going to do with your wealth and, and, and how, you, how you identify yourself as that. And I think there were people, a lot of people then were inspired by that. That was one of the things that started to really lead the shift. Thank you, Rob. There is another question over there. Okay. Hello, Rob. Uh, I'm also Rob from Cambridgeshire in England. Um, so many of us in this room in Malta are scientists, um, museum professionals, science centre professionals. But so much that you've spoken about today makes me think of the economy and um, how we um, live our lives. So how could us scientists and museum professionals here become imaginative citizen economists? How can we change the economics of how um, we, we live our lives? Yeah, beautiful question. Thank you, Rob. I, I, I think that uh, every 
every museum has has a, has has more power than you might like to think. I I would suppose. I don't know work in a museum. It's your sector, not mine. But I've seen, for example, in Derby, in the north of England. Well, kind of in the Midlands in the Derby Silk Mill, which was a, a, a museum of the industrial history of, of Derby, which had become a bit like a bit boring and people didn't really go there anymore. And they hired an incredible woman called Hannah Fox, who came in as the director of that museum and who ran a beautiful process of reimagining that museum. Anything could happen here. And they ran all kinds of amazing... It's a story that I write up in more detail in the book, but um, they... They created like a, um, a workshop in the middle of the museum and volunteers came in and everything that they needed in the museum was made in a kind of a lab in the middle of the museum. And they ran this incredible consultation process where they said to the community, literally, this could be anything. What They put bands on in there, they put different things on. And what came out of that was a museum of making, reimagining it as a museum of making, celebrating the city's history of making, but also being a place where, where things were made. And they, and they developed a whole new way of doing the work to restore that building where they reimagined the tendering process for the contracts. So rather than creating one contract to do the whole project, they broke it down into lots of smaller tenders to allow lots of other local, smaller local companies to, to, to be involved in that. And part of the contract was you have to involve local volunteers in every aspect of what you're doing. So they put the community really at the middle of it. And the other thing that comes to me when you ask that is if you look at the city of Preston in the north of England, where they've created what's become known the Preston model. I think if anybody puts the word model after the name of your city, you generally know you're doing something quite well. The Preston model was that they they kind of run out of ideas for the economy. They had one idea, which was they wanted to build a new shopping centre in the middle of the city, like wildly imaginative stuff, you know. And then the, 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 the company pulled out and that scheme collapsed and they had nothing else. This was around 2012. And so they commissioned a piece of work to look at, as a, as a, as a city council, where does the money that they spend go? Like they, they spend something like £750 million a year of public money where did it go? And they found that only 4% of it actually went into the economy of Preston and all the rest of it just left through big companies and contractors and stuff like that. So they changed the model to say, we need to make sure as much money as possible can stay locally in the city. They're now, I think, up to about 30%. But municipal museums can do that too, to look at how you, how you spend money, how you invest money, uh, to see the museum maybe as being a, a catalyst for supporting the new economy. We do an amazing event here in my town every year called the Local Entrepreneur Forum, where five people stand up and present their ideas to the local community and ask for their investment. There's now 50 businesses in our town that wouldn't exist without that happening. So I think museums can be a catalyst for the imagination. They can be a catalyst for the new economy, and they can... They can do what they do in a very different way. But I would recommend the Happy Museums Networkers who've been doing quite a lot of work already thinking about uh, some of this stuff. Thank you very much, Rob. I'm afraid that we just use our time. So please give a big applause for Rob and for his talk. Thank, thank you very much, Rob. Now we have the coffee break, and then we follow with our sessions again. Thank you very much to be here. <laughs>